If you visit the tropical forests of Central and South America, you might be lucky enough to spot a parade of leafcutter ants tirelessly carrying food back to their nests. But did you know that those ants aren't taking those leaf cuttings home to eat? Because I did not know that. The fact is they physically can't survive on plant material. Instead, the ants use those leaves to feed the gardens of fungi that they grow in their colonies, which are their primary source of food. And both the age and the sophistication of these little farms put our farms to shame. While we've been farming for around 10,000 to 12,000 years, the ancestors of these ants have been doing it for around 60 million years. And over that time, they've been through many of their own agricultural revolutions that have changed not just how they farm, but also the very biology of their fungi that they grow and the biology of the ants themselves. So when and how and why did ants start farming? It looks like the relationship between ants and fungi may have emerged from the ashes of a famously devastating extinction event. Now these ants didn't start out as fungus farmers. <laughs> For much of their history, they did what most ants still do today. They go out into the world and eat the things that they find, which also is how I go through life. But everything changed for them when they started farming. And this transition happened only once in the subgroup known as the Atini, because they're teeny ants. That's not why they call them that, actually. There are more than 250 species of these ants, all of them in the Western Hemisphere and all of them fungus farmers. But not all of these Atine ants farm the same way. Most practice what some researchers have called lower agriculture, the system with the least complex farms, which is thought to have been the first to evolve. In this system, the fungi aren't fully dependent on the ants. They're what are known as facultative symbionts. They can survive without the ants and interbreed with other wild fungi. So they're not really fully domesticated. And if they end up disappearing from the colony somehow, the ants can just replace them with wild versions of the cultivated fungi species. But other ants, including the leaf cutters, practice higher agriculture. In these colonies, the fungi are obligate symbionts. They're completely dependent on their ant farmers. They can't survive in the wild and they can't interbreed with free living fungi. They've been fully domesticated by ants, which I think is strange. But just like with us, Farming is even a part of the ant's culture, if you can call it that. Like when young queens of these ant species leave their families to start new colonies, they take a piece of the fungus with them to start their own gardens, passing these strains down from queen to queen across generations. So how did this relationship between ants and fungus actually start? And how did it evolve over time into the different agricultural systems that we see today? Well, the fossil record has only given us some pieces of the story, mainly because while we do have lots of fossils of ants, many trapped in amber, they can't easily tell us how those ants actually lived. But there is some extremely rare fossil evidence of fungus farming in ancient Atine ants in the form of nests that contain traces of fungus filaments. But these are from relatively recently, like around five to 10 million years ago. This means that to dig deeper into the origins of fungus farming in ants, we've had to find another way to study them. Enter the field of phylogenomics, or using genomic data to reconstruct an organism's evolutionary history. In a paper published in 2017, researchers at the Smithsonian tried to trace the history of fungus farming in ants across deep time using their genomes. They compared the DNA of more than 100 different ant species from around the Western Hemisphere, some that practiced higher agriculture, some that practiced lower agriculture, and some that didn't farm at all. By comparing their genetic relatedness and how long ago the different groups diverged from one another, based on the mutations that each lineage had accumulated, they could reconstruct their evolutionary family tree. And this revealed some intriguing clues about where, when, and why each agricultural system first evolved. The tree seemed to suggest that the Atini, which contains all of the fungus farming ant species, originally emerged in the rainforests of South America around 66 million years ago. And almost immediately, they diversified really quickly, radiating into many different groups. By 61 million years ago, they had established themselves as lower agriculturalists full-time fungus farmers. And if this time period rings a bell, there's a good reason for that. This was a direct aftermath of the KPG mass extinction with the asteroid and the volcanism and the end of the reign of the dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs anyway. And the fact that the origin of fungus farming in ants lines up with a period of global ecological chaos is probably not a coincidence. After all, the impact must have caused all kinds of environmental mayhem, <laughs> including a sort of nuclear winter in which clouds of dust and ash blocked out sunlight. This would have been catastrophic for photosynthesizers like plants at the base of the food chain and for species that relied on them. But fungi are decomposers and they don't rely on sunlight for growth. So they might actually have thrived in these conditions. The dark, humid, post-KPG world filled with dead and decaying organisms would have been a paradise for fungi. The earliest Atine ants, on the other hand, would have had a 
much harder time. Suddenly, foraging for food would have been a real challenge, at least above ground. So it's easy to imagine why Atine ants might have begun harnessing fungi as their sole food source. It's a stable and reliable crop that could grow underground, perfectly suited to the apocalypse. And this changed not just their lifestyle, but elements of their biology too. Research has shown that Atine ants lost the ability to produce an important amino acid called arginine very early on in their evolution. And ever since then, they've been totally reliant on fungi to get that amino acid. This may explain why we have yet to find a single example of an Atine ant species that stopped farming. They literally can't survive without their crops. So while the evidence is kind of circumstantial, it's at least plausible that the devastation of the KPG was the catalyst for the first agricultural revolution in Atine ants transitioning from foragers to farmers. But it wasn't until 30 million years later that one group of ants experienced their second agricultural revolution, transitioning from lower to higher agriculture. The researchers found the genetic signal of this transition at somewhere between 27 million to 31 million years ago in the early Oligocene epoch. This is when the group of ants that practice higher agriculture seems to have emerged and branched off from the other atines. And just like the ants' first agricultural revolution, the timing of this one matched up with a period of environmental upheaval. This was the aftermath of the terminal Eocene event that took place, as the name suggests, at the end of the Eocene Epoch, around 34 million years ago. For reasons we don't fully understand, the planet went through a period of global cooling at this time, which allowed drier, less humid habitats to expand. And some Atine ants left the rainforests of South America for these drier habitats and brought their fungi with them, which may have spurred a radical shift in their relationship. After all, dry habitats are pretty inhospitable to fungi. So researchers think that in these new environments, the fungi became completely dependent on the ants for survival. They couldn't live outside of the well-tended, humid underground gardens of the ant colony. And over time, they became reproductively isolated from their free-living relatives, which had largely remained in the rainforests. This marked the switch from facultative to obligate symbiosis in the fungi, and from lower to higher agriculture in the ants. These fungi are now found only in higher atine ant colonies, and they've developed some specific adaptations in this fully domesticated existence. For example, they have nutrient-rich structures called gonglidia that can be efficiently harvested and eaten by the ants. These structures aren't seen in wild fungi or in lineages grown by ants that practice lower agriculture. And this relationship seems to have reached new heights in the leafcutter ants. This group is represented by around 50 species, which are widespread in South America, Central America, Mexico, and some Southern parts of the US. And the researcher's analysis suggests that the leafcutters were the most recent group of higher agriculturalists to evolve emerging around 18 to 19 million years ago. They have incredibly complex colonies with big fungal gardens and even sophisticated hygiene practices to protect their fungal crops from disease. Like there are certain areas of their nests where they leave their waste to keep it away from their gardens. And some ants even have bacteria on them that produce antimicrobial compounds, which help protect the fungus from pathogens. Kind of wish I had that. And unlike other atines, which usually just collect whatever dead plant and animal material they can find, leafcutter ants source only the finest, freshest biomass, cutting it straight off the plant. <laughs> In fact, leafcutters go through so much plant material, they're considered the dominant herbivore of the neotropics harvesting more total plant material than any other animal group. So in a way, the leafcutter ants have kind of brought fungus farming full circle. What may have started out as a way to survive without plants after the KPG mass extinction has now come all the way back around to depending on plants for the system to keep going. If the story of the Atine ants tells us anything, is to never underestimate their ability to innovate over time. Through 60 million years of evolution, facing challenge after challenge in the form of global environmental change, the ants and their fungi adapted, adjusted, and thrived. If this got you itching for more ant content, then check out our episode, The Reign of the Hell Ants. Giant ant thanks <laughs> to this month's fungi eontologists, Annie Derrick Higgins, Chase Archambault, Colton, Jake Hart, John Davison Ng, and Melanie Lamb Carnivale. Become an eonite at patreon.com slash eons, and you can get fun perks like submitting a joke for us to read, like this one from Sophie Parsons. Okay. Brace yourself, Blake. What did the big flower say to the small flower? What's up, bud? Oh, <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> and as always, thank you for joining me in the Adam Lowe Studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more creature features. 